start. So, so first, of course, uh, I would like to thank uh, Hugo, Jiminy Le Copain, for, for inviting me here to speak of, of, of Liouville theory and, and the DOZZ formula. So, uh, um, so of course, I found, uh, so with my colleagues, you know, we found the quest of, you know, understanding this DOZZ formula quite exciting, and, and, and I hope that I'll be able to communicate to you some of this excitement. Um, when we started this a few years ago, at least for us mathematicians, it was a rather mysterious formula, and now we, we finally understand it, at least with, uh, in a probabilistic uh, language. So I hope, as I said, I can communicate a bit of this excitement on, on the DOZZ formula. So maybe I should start by explaining uh, so the research program that uh, I've been involved in with my, my colleagues uh, for the past years and that we're still developing uh, for the next few years uh, to come. So, um, so, my, so let me at least give the name of my colleagues uh, you know, that have been working with me on, you know, on, on the program that I'm, I'm going to explain to you in a few minutes. So there's François David, uh, who's at the, the CEA. Uh, so uh, there's Colin Guillermo who's here. So, so he's a specialist of geometry uh, at Orsay. So there's uh, Antico Pienen, okay, who's at Helsinki, and of course Rémi Rod, uh, who's at Marne la Vallée. And also, uh, okay, let me just say a word on my PhD students. So there's Yang. Uh, who just got his PhD? There's a white, white. Really? It's not okay. White. So there's. Is that okay? No. Yeah. So there's Yang, just got his PhD. There's a uh, Guillaume Remy and Tunan Zhu, you know, working on this project. So I'm going to explain. So roughly, what is our our, our, our research uh, program? Well. It's, to, it's kind of to unify, to reconcile two, two fields of, of theoretical physics. So, okay. So let me kind of give you uh, both sides of the picture. So on one side you have statistical physics. Okay, so statistical physics. And probability theory. Okay. Okay, and well, what is the goal in statistical physics? Well, if I were, to, well, it's kind of to study, you know, and, and compute, say, path integrals. Okay, so something that's going, you know, you want to compute something like a function of a field phi with respect to some action, what is called an action. So when you're going to have a potential, and you're going to have some background measure on your field. So uh, roughly a, a large amount of statistical physics is about, you know, studying these kinds of objects. So in the discrete, they're usually very well defined. You know, this is just a discrete measure, and so you try to take scaling limits, but you can also try to directly construct them in the continuum and, and study them, et cetera. So I'd say that this is a large amount of of what you want to do in, in statistical physics. Now, for Liouville, so for those who don't like path integrals, let me say right away that today, except for this small introduction, there will be no path integrals, <laughs> just probability theory. Okay, but let me just say a few words. So in Liouville, well, what you what is well, okay, I'm going to put a 1 over 4 pi here, but it doesn't matter much, put a 1 over 4 pi, but just to be consistent with my notes. So in Newville, well, the potential is, is going to be, so say, 4 pi mu. So mu is the positive cosmological constant. Uh, if I really, uh, and so <laughs> exponential gamma to the phi, where gamma is a parameter, which is going to belong to 0, 2. I'm only going to discuss this case in these lecture notes. We can go beyond 2, but don't, well, beyond at least 2, 2. 
I'm not going to discuss this in these lecture notes. And if I really want to be rigorous, I have to add some curvature term. So here you have some manifold, say. And so Q curvature times phi. And Q is this special value that people have seen talks on Liouville field theory or Liouville quantum gravity. No, it's Q, so this is the Q. OK. And in Liouville, what you want to compute, you know, on the statistic, so in the statistical physics language, say, is these path integrals where <coughs> you look at the correlations of your fields. Sorry, it's going to be K in my notes, I guess. C alpha K, Z K. So these guys belong to the complex plane. So in Uville, the manifold is going to be C, or the Riemann sphere. Okay, and this guy here, it is what's his definition? Well, V alpha Z is exponential alpha phi Z. So I'm writing it in a physicist notation, huh? I'm okay. So this is for Uville, but more generally, okay, we're on the side of statistical physics here. Okay. <coughs> so, um, well, if you do probability theory, so probabilistic side, so probability, what are the objects involved on this side of the picture? Well, it's the Gaussian free field. I mean, so that's the GFF. So in these lectures, in these lectures, in in these talks, of course, our GFF will be Gaussian free field. And of course, so this is going to be the rigorous thing behind this gradient phi square. And in Uville, v, v is exponential. So there's going to be the exponential of the Gaussian free field. So x of GFF. And so this is so Kahan's Gaussian multiplicative chaos. is going to be called GMC in the lecture notes and in this talk. Without, okay, so if someone at some point forgets, I'm sometimes I'm going to say GFF, GMC, probably. Uh, so, yes? Ah, oh. oh, sorry, it's gamma. Yeah, phi, which belongs to zero, too. Okay, and on the, you know, in the statistical physics literature, uh, there are lots of formulas, okay? So, so as I said, I'm going to present two, 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 uh, two sides of the picture that we're trying to unify. So the first side is statistical physics, and then we'll come to conformal field theory, conformal bootstrap. So, but still on the statistical physics side, there are lots of formulas for these path integrals or for these exponential of the Gaussian free fields. So let me give you an example. There's Fyodorov Bouchot formula. There's, okay, there's a formula by Fyodorov, uh, Le Dussal, Rousseau, etc. And so they have exact formulas for, for these kinds of path integrals or in probabilistic language for exponential free fields. Uh, Fyodorov, uh, Le Dussal, Rousseau. Okay, so these are in the middle of the 2000s. Okay. Okay, so that's one side of the picture. And so there's another side of the picture, and there are numerous specialists of this side in this room. So Is this kind of formulas were not known about Gaussian free field before until mid 90s. I thought that everything about Gaussian free field was known. It's it's not it's not Gaussian free field, it's exponential of Gaussian free field. Okay, uh, well, that's... It's a vertex operator, everything is not exactly right. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, I'm not surprised that it's not exactly, I'm surprised that you say it was only discovered in error. Okay, so here's an open question, and I don't know if physics can answer this, is uh, if you take uh, the exponential of a Gaussian free field on the Riemann sphere, 
it's a pro and you integrate it on the Riemann sphere. It's a it's a random variable. What's its distribution? Does it have a density? What's the density? That uh, that you cannot extract from the DOZZ formula a priori. And so uh, so what I'm talking okay. Okay, I know what you're because you're you're a specialist of conformal field theory, so you compute correlations. I still did correlation functions then. Maybe. They're trivial. Okay. No, no, I agree. But what is not trivial is uh, to look at what's going to appear in uh, Liouville field theory is you're going to integrate your your vertex operators on a on on, on a surface. And you're gonna have fractional moments of this to compute. And this is hard to compute. I agree that if you take the expectation or uh, of a product of these guys, and if it's a free field up there, it's trivial. However, if you integrate it in a, on a surface, finding the distribution is very tough, and I, there, I think there's no answer. No one knows the answer to, to the question I, I, well, I, I raised. Okay, so just to answer, it's integral over zero two pi. The distribution, exact distribution of integral over zero two pi, of the free field on the circle. So this has an exact distribution, okay? And uh, this was conjectured by Fyodor Bouchot, and this was proved a month ago by, by Guillaume Rémy, one of our students. So Rémy proved uh, that this formula is correct. And so with Tunanzu to the, the generalizing. And how do you do this? Well, you map it to Liouville. Okay, so on the other side there's I want to say CFT, conformal field, conformal field theory. So usually nowadays, so <laughs> there are so 3D specialists, 2D specialists of the conformal bootstrap. So that's the other side of the picture. So on the other side of the picture, it's kind of a different language that appears. So the goal here, you know, just like the goal over there is to study and compute these functionals, the goal of a CFT is, is to compute correlations, and they use a very powerful method called the conformal bootstrap. So it was used efficiently by, by you and your colleagues in, in 3D, and so there's Sylvain, Raoul Santakia, who, who works in this framework in 2D here. Okay, and so um, <coughs> on this side of a picture, you have you know, lots of natural objects like the stress energy tensor, so it's, you know, and it gives, it gives rise to ward identities. So ho the holomorphic ward identities. You have degenerate fields. What is called degenerate fields, and this, is, this gives rise to differential equations called the BPZ. So after Belavin, Polyakov, Zamolochikov, so that's 84 differential equations. Okay, and okay, and you have formulas, of course, and so there's the DOZZ, for instance. For okay, now as I said, DOZZ. So this is after Dorn, Otto, Zamolochikov, Zamolochikov, who the, so the brothers Zamolochikov, who found this formula independently and around 1995-1994. Okay, so our program is to our program is kind of to reconcile using rigorous probability these two worlds uh, in the case of, of Liouville. Okay. In the case of, of Liouville conformal field theory. Okay. So uh, there's a broad audience here and uh, I guess I have to convince everyone that, uh, that they should come back on Friday. Um, yeah, so I gave lecture notes, it's filmed, so I think it's a hard task, but um, still let me try to, to convince you why this can be interesting. So for instance, uh, in this room there are specialists of the bootstrap, uh, and uh, well, why can it be interesting? Uh, first, uh, you know, when you, when you construct correlations using this so-called conformal bootstrap, this recursive method, on a conceptual level, it's not obvious that the correlations exist in a, cons in a consistent way. Usually, uh, you know, there's 
what is called crossing symmetry relations and you have to check numerically that what you're doing is consistent. So this way of doing things for Liouville is going to, to pr prove consistency of the theory. That's one thing. Uh, maybe this is too conceptual, but uh, there, there are other reasons that can be interesting to physicists is that by constructing correlations by using probability in these path integral formulations, in some cases we get easier to handle formulas for these correlations compared to the conformal bootstrap. And in particular, I will state in lecture three, so uh, uh, the so-called uh, knisnik polyakov zamorochikov conjecture on planar maps. And in this conjecture, the correlations of Uville, which arise as scaling limits of observables on the planar map, okay, well, they can be rather easily described using probability theory, whereas in the bootstrap language, uh, they're not that easy to describe. I mean, of course, maybe we can debate this, but uh, I think it's, it's probability is easier to, to, to study these correlations. So, on s uh, so take home message is probability enables to construct, you know, nice formulas for correlations and nicer formulas than sometimes the bootstrap method. Okay, so for specialists of planar maps, I already kind of said why it can be interesting for, 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 for you guys. Um, it's because uh, of, you know, the, the KPZ conjecture. So if you, you map, you, you, you conformally embed a planar map in the sphere uh, and you take the scaling limit, uh, the fields on this map, so the volume form, the Ising spin, if you're studying the Ising model, say, they're supposed to be described by the so-called uh, KPZ conjecture and um, and so uh, Liouville uh, gives you uh, and, and the KPZ conjecture tells you that the scaling limits uh, factorize into a, a let's say a regular lattice part times a Liouville conformal field theory part. So this will be the part of lecture three. I'll explain in lecture three a bit in more detail the KPZ conjecture. And finally, for those who are specialists of statistical physics or, or, or probability theory, as I already said kind of here, you know, it's, you can see this program as some way of giving exact formulas on the exponential of the free field. Okay, so it's, a, it's an integrability program if, if you're not at all inter interested in conformal bootstraps or conformal field theory. Okay, so I hope I kind of convinced everyone that maybe there, there could be an interest of coming back. Um, and so now I, I, I'm going to give you maybe a, so I'm going to give you a little summary of, of, of the four lectures I'm going to give here. So the lectures are go really going to follow these notes, okay? You don't have, no. Okay. So they're going to follow these, these lecture notes so you can, you know, you can, basically I'm going to do everything on the board with these notes. Just, you know, opening up and so you can follow easily. So let me give you a, a little summary. So in lecture one, okay, so what is lecture one? So I'm going to give, so now I'm going to forget in lecture one on this path integral business, I'm going to do probability theory today. So lecture one, I'm going to give a probabilistic Realistic definition of the correlations of the Liouville correlations. So I'm going to okay. So this is based on our work with uh, with François David Antikoupienen Rémy Rod. So Liouville you go quantum gravity on the Riemann sphere. So, so here, I will not explain. Riemann has one n. No, I forgot. Okay, so I'm just going to set a probabilistic definition, and it's only in lecture three where I'm going to justify this definition from the path integral perspective. But today, I just want to define every single object we're going to work on in a very, uh, you know, precise way using probability. And I'm going to state the DOZZ theorem. So this is based 
on two works with Anti, Tupianen, and Remy Rod. So KRV1, let's say, and KRV2. I'm going to state what we proved. Okay. The, we gave a probabilistic content to DOZZ. Okay, so that's lecture one, so maybe. Okay, I'm going to go to lecture two. Uh, so lecture two. Um, lecture two. Okay, so I'm going to define in lecture two. Define the two-point correlation. The two-point correlation function of Uville. More precisely, I'm going to give a probabilistic formula for the two-point correlation. So, okay, here's another abbreviation: LCFT Uville conformal field theory. Okay. <coughs> so roughly. I'm going to define, so in, in Newville conformal field theory, the two-point correlation function is called the reflection coefficient. And so I'm going to define with my language here, so this is going to be my notation with these vertex operators. Um, I'm going to define this thing. So It depends on gamma and mu, so I'm going to stress this. And it's going to be defined as the limit as epsilon goes to zero of epsilon, so quite naturally, I mean, of this. So I take a three point correlation function. It blows up when epsilon, when one of the vertex goes to one. So this is going to one. Uh, you know, it's exponential epsilon something, so it's going to one. And it blows up, and if you you, you cure the divergency, then you get a two-point correlation function. And I'm, so for those, I'm going to explain why this is, so if alpha equals gamma, I'm going to explain why this is the partition function of a random measure called the quantum sphere. So the quantum sphere is a, an equivalence class of random measures, which was introduced by Duplantier Miller Sheffield in a paper called uh, Uville Quantum Gravity as, as a Mating of Trees. Okay, so they develop a theory of random surfaces with two marked points, zero and infinity. And I'm going to explain how this enters ex precisely into the framework of Uville field theory. It's nothing but working with the two-point correlation function of Uville. Okay, so this I'll explain. And uh, of course, I'll get a corollary to the DOZZ formula. So the DOZZ formula is, sorry, it's a formula for the three-point. So if you get a formula for the three-point correlation function, of course you get a formula for the two-point, since it's the limit of a three-point. Okay, so this is it's an exact formula, DOZZ, so on this. Okay, so it's maybe a bit abstract, you know, this notation of vertex, but I, I, I'm going to jump into the, the rigorous definition in, in 10 minutes, okay? So lecture three is going to be, uh, I'm going to, maybe I'll say it uh, out loud rather. So lecture three, I'm going to explain why the definitions of lecture one of these Liouville correlations, why they are a faithful representation of this, these path integrals. It's probably it's, could be interesting to physicists that to see how from a path integral, which is ill-defined for us, we get a clean probabilistic definition for, for the Liouville correlation functions. And also in lecture three, I'll state the KPZ conjecture on planar maps, so which says, uh, uh, which, you know, says that Liouville describes the, the scaling limit of observables on, on planar maps. Finally, lecture four, uh, I'm going to give a sketch of, uh, of proof of the DOZZ formula. <coughs> so lecture four, so I skip lecture three on the board. So sketch of proof, I can't, you know, 
I made a choice when I get for giving these lectures. Such a is that I'd rather people have, you know, good knowledge, a good understanding of the definitions, rather than straight away jump into uh, proving the GOCC formula. I really want to spend time defining the correlation functions, two-point correlation functions, etc. And then in lecture four, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the proof. So the main ingredients are the BPZ equations. So we're going to implement in a probabilistic setting. So remember, I want to reconcile two worlds. I'm, we're going, I'm going to show you how to implement or this thing here into the world of probability. So, um, so basically, this, so this is based on the first paper with Antti and Rémy. Essentially, the idea is if you want to compute a three-point correlation function, you add what is called a degenerate field. So maybe in a more understandable language for probabilists, what, what we do is you want to compute an integral. Let me give you an example of, of what, what, I, what maybe if there's a take-home message on how we prove GOZZ formula, it's, it's the following. Imagine you want to compute this integral. Okay, so if you want to compute this integral, there are numerous methods. But when you know you're, you're starting math, probably the most famous one is if you try to, to compute this directly, usually you fail. So what do you do? You try to add a parameter inside and study the associated function. So the one way to prove this is to do this. So you add, a, you look at this function. Okay? Now what, why did you, so the integral you want to compute, it's 5, 0. 5 of infinity is 0. So you know the boundary, one boundary condition, not the other. But why is this interesting? Because you can take the derivative of this guy. Okay? And so the derivative is this. And so this you can compute. It's 1 over lambda squared plus 1. Uh, or, or more generally, it, 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 phi is going to satisfy differential equation. And so it's the same idea behind proving the BPZ, the, um, the DOZZ form. You want to compute this some kind of infinite dimensional path integral in the physics language. So you add a parameter inside, which is z, a complex variable, and you show that this thing satisfies a differential equation. You look at what happens when z goes to 0 or z goes to 1. You know, you look at the boundary conditions. And these boundary conditions, as you can imagine, well, are going to be three-point correlation functions. So you're going to get lots of relations between these three-point correlation functions. And at the end, you're going to conclude that uh, there's only one solution, DOZZ. That's the rough idea behind the proof. And uh, so it's based on this. And it's based on you know, studying this four-point correlation function on the boundary. So when z goes to 0 or 1. Now what happens when z goes to 0, 1? A physicist would say, OK, you're doing an operator product expansion. So you're studying your four-point correlation on the boundary. So OPE. So a mathematician would say, I'm doing a Taylor expansion. Taylor expansion. I'm just And so these ideas of using, you know, adding a parameter in the three-point correlation function and, and looking what happens on the boundary values and, and using the relations that, that are called crossing symmetry, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful idea. And in fact, it was an idea of, of Teschner in the, in the context of Duville. So maybe I should put a name here <coughs> because he had nice ideas. So he's a physicist, but he had nice ideas on Newville, and, 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 and so I have to, I'd like to emphasize his, his name. You laugh because I say he's a physicist? Well, because you said he was a physicist, but he had nice ideas. Ah, OK, that's horrible. <laughs> and it's filmed, too. Uh, <laughs> no, I, you, 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 I, I, I cite a lot of physicists, and I, I gave a, a, a list of reviews from, don't from don't physics. Don't worry. You don't take it seriously. I take physics seriously. OK.
so that's the plan. Uh, maybe I was a bit uh, a bit uh, long. Uh, okay, so I'm going to to jump into uh, to lecture one. So give a probabilistic definition of so the the Liouville correlation. So the so I'm going to set the definition and show you why it exists. So the first thing I have to do. So it's written in the lecture notes, lecture one. I'm first going to introduce the Gaussian free field because I need the Gaussian free field to give a meaning to this guy. Then I'm going to introduce the exponential of the Gaussian free field to give a meaning to this guy. And then I'm going to set my definition for Uville. Okay? And uh, so we can discuss. And you'll see the Gaussian free field vertex part. I, I, I'll do a special one minute uh, explanation. Okay, and then at the end, I think I'll have time, I'll present to you how DOZZ themselves found the DOZZ formula. Okay. <coughs> uh, okay, so let's start. So, for, so I know that, just want to say for, for people who, once again, the physicist, uh, there's going to be formal math, so I'm sorry, I, I, have, to, I have to give uh, exact definitions. There are lots of mathematicians in the room, and after all, it's my job. <laughs> so I hope uh, it won't bore them with technical, you know, formal definitions. So I'm going to start with the Gaussian free field. Okay, so let me start with... GFF and Gaussian Multiplicative Chaos. So I'm following uh, my lecture notes. I'm at section 2.1 in the lecture notes. Okay, so now I'm really reading kind of what you, you all have under, the, under your eyes. So I'm going to start with the full plane Gaussian free field. We call it X bar. So X bar, uh, so I, it's going to be defined as, so first, let me let me give you a, a few notations. So, sorry, I'm going to start with a notation. So, what I'm going to call S of C, it's you know it's the functions which are smooth, C infinity, and you know all the derivatives go to zero faster than any polynomial. Okay, it's it's the I think it's called the Schwartz space of functions because you can take Fourier transform. Okay, and the tempered distributions are the guys who you're allowed to pair with. The functions with ha which have a, I didn't write it like so. It's not an S line. It's an S. Okay. So you have the space of distributions. Now, there's a subspace of functions uh, which decrease rapidly at infinity. It's the ones which have average zero. So I'm going to say that f is an f zero of c. Okay, if it has average zero. So integral over c f of x, so the Lebesgue measure is going to be written like this, is equal to 0. Now, there's also a space of distributions which act on these functions of average 0. It's the ones which live in the tempered distributions, uh, modulo uh, constants. They're defined up to a constant. Okay, And so the full plane GFF, x bar, what is the, f so it's definition 2.1, so let me, definition 2.1, uh, I don't want to take this one out, so definition 2.1, definition 2.1, so the full plane GFF is, is what I call x bar. So if I integrate it, so I'm taking the, the notation of generalized functions where, you know, when I apply my, my distribution, my random distribution, so it's a random guy living in here. So he belongs to the tempered distributions. Okay. <coughs> Actually, modulo R. Okay, so it's defined up to a constant. So if I take someone of average zero here, and I take another guy g 
of average zero, then this is a Gaussian variable. And if I want to determine my field, I just need to compute the covariance with respect to these two guys. And so I get, so I wrote a simple integral in here. So I get c squared f of x, g of y, log 1 over x minus y, d2x, d2y. And this is nothing but the Fourier transform So the Fourier transform is 1 over xi squared, so or 1 over f squared if you're in for frequency. And so if f equals g, you see this is pa so for f equals g, this is non-zero, I mean, non-negative. So that's the so it's defined up to a constant because if you change x bar by a constant, since this guy has average zero, it's because the log here the Correlation is, is is only defined uh, is only you know conditionally positive definite. Now, once I have a full plane GFF, I can construct all the Gaussian free fields I need in these lectures or or on the plane. And so, what you do is written in the notes. Well, if you want to define something which is defined not modulo constants, well, all you have to do is take x bar and 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 remove an average of x bar with respect to a probability. So. If I have a probability measure, sorry, if I have a probability measure on the complex plane, so this is a probability, well, I can look at this field, x bar, I take out its average with respect to the probability, so let's write it like this. Okay, so this is a now this is a field which is not defined up to a constant. Because if I shift x bar by a constant, here and here, they, it goes away. So it's really defined uh, against any test, test function. And so this is how you produce all your Gaussian free fields on the complex plane. You take a full plane, which is defined up to a constant, which has logarithmic covariance. You take out any average of this guy with respect to a probability measure, and it gives you a, a Gaussian free field. Okay. Uh, of course, rho has to have some regularity because if you take a, something which gives only mass to one point, it's not defined. So, uh, essentially, I will not discuss this anymore in these lectures. But essentially, you know, you can you can integrate your Gaussian free field against much more than just you know smooth functions. As long as this thing here is finite, okay. For instance, you can take uh, only continuous functions, which you can you can take really pro probability measures which are not regular. Uh, as long as this thing is finite, you can consider this guy here, okay. So if if so, the the real definition is you need if you want to define this, you need you know a finite energy condition. So. It's just that I start with a clean definition, but then as soon as I have something like this, I'm allowed to uh, consider this variable, and I can consider this field. Now, there are, um, so I give examples in the lecture notes. Uh, and so I'm able to avoid, you know, uh, things get, getting complicated. I will only work with one Gaussian free field in all four lectures. And I'm going to take rho, uh, rho will be the uniform probability measure on the unit circle. Okay, so in all these notes, x is going to be this. The Gaussian free field I'm going to work with in these notes. It's going to be x bar of x minus integral zero over two pi x bar e theta d theta. So let me register this formula. So I have a, an index of notations in my lecture notes. Uh, I'm only working with this guy. So it has. A, if you take the average with respect to the unit circle, it, it's worth zero. So this is a Gaussian free field, and the covariance can be computed explicitly. It's very easy. So 
for a mathematician, this is a, an abuse of notation, of course. You know, it, it doesn't exist point-wise, but I think you get the, the point. You, if you integrate against, you know, functions and, and, and this, what I write, makes sense. So you can compute explicitly the covariance of this guy, and it's this. And this is, my no this is a fixed notation, so x plus is x maximum with 1. So this is the Gaussian free field uh, I'll be working on uh, in all the notes. Okay, so it's a full plane. I take out its average with respect to the unit circle. It's a well-defined random field living in the space of, you know, Schwartz uh, distributions. And it has this, the following explicit covariance. Okay? So we have to agree on, you have to understand the definition. Now, so this is the gradient part, and now I'm going to, th there's a break at, at, at half, or uh, is it two hours? Uh, okay, I, I think I'll, I'll have a break at, at, at 3 p.m., just a two minutes. Okay, so now I'm going to define the exponential of the Gaussian free field, x, that I'll be working with uh, for all these, uh, all these notes. Okay, so so formally it's it's a it's a it's a random so it's a random measure I think. For physicists, they'd rather hear a random volume form, because I guess physicists would say that this d phi is the measure. So it's a random volume form, which formally is written like this. So I have my, my x, my Gaussian free field, which is fixed in these lectures. So this is what the object I'm going to define now. And what is g of x? It's 1 over x Okay, so it's just some, some nice continuous function worth 1 inside the unit circle and 1 over x to the power 4 outside the unit circle, outside the, the unit disk, sorry. It's defined on the, on the complex plane. Okay. Remember my notation, x plus is x uh, uh, max 1. So this will be clear in lecture 3 why I'm introducing this guy. Okay? So... Uh, you see, since this guy is not defined point-wise, you have to regularize it. So you define this. So this is uh, the proposition 2.2. So Kahan, 85. How do you define this guy? Well, you, you take your Gaussian free field. You regularize it with any smoothing procedure which is reasonable. Okay, <coughs> and you take the limit. So it's equal to this limit. That's how you define things. So in the language of probability, if x epsilon is a Gaussian free field that I've smoothed at, at scale epsilon, so typically what am I going to take here? I'm going to take, okay, what am, I'm going to write it down here. I'm going to take x epsilon of x is going to be a smooth mollification. So theta is going to be some smooth function, say. I mollify my Gaussian free field against the smooth function. Okay, so I make it, so you know I'm smoothing it at scale epsilon. I take the limit and then uh, I get a random measure which is called Gaussian multiplicative chaos. So this is what Kahan proved in 1985. 
So I don't want to go into all the history of these measures. He proved it in some setting, and then there's been a huge amount of papers, you know, extending the, set, the setting of convergence of this theorem. I gave a reference in, in these notes, a reference to a work of uh, Nathanael Berestiki, who, who, you know, who, who has a nice proof of, of this kind of theorem uh, in a general setting. So actually, you can really smooth this guy uh, with something which is not even C infinity. You can also, and you can take lots of smoothing procedures. One which I'll use here is the circle average smoothing. So I guess Duplantier Sheffield. Uh, <coughs> uh, Duplantier Sheffield used this smoothing procedure in one of their papers. Oh well, in, in all actually. So basically, the take-home message is: however you 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 regularize your field. You know, there's there's a theorem that says that it converges to a, a random volume form. These ra these volume forms, and that these. These, especially these random volume forms do not depend on the way you smooth your field here. Okay, if theta, you replace it with some theta tilde, you'll get the same limit, okay, in probability. And you can even work with discrete Gaussian free fields. If you want, you can start with a discrete Gaussian free field, you know, and construct a discrete measure, go to the limit, you're always going to converge to the same object called Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Okay? Now, where is this condition gamma smaller than 2? It's because Kahan proved. So where am I going to continue? So Kahan proved that. So it's in the proposition. So let, let me put it also in this proposition. So it's still prop it's the same proposition, 2.2. OK. M gamma is different from 0 if and only if gamma. So let's say gamma is positive, because by symmetry you can take it positive. If and only if gamma belongs to the interval 0, 2. OK? So that's where this comes from. Because uh, <coughs> I can give you a, a few line proof of this by a scaling argument, which will maybe. But basically, when gamma gets big, if you you know if you if you if you if you simulate, say you take epsilon very small, you simulate this density, you're going to see that as gamma goes big. It, it concentrates more and more on very large spikes. And when gamma gets too big, there's not enough room for one spike to exist, basically. It's getting more and more concentrated, this guy, on a very small set. And at some point, uh, this, there's not enough room for it to exist anymore. That's what's happening. Now, uh, uh, I don't know how much I can give a very, I don't know. That's why I'm taking a break. Uh, I mean, I can. I can, I, uh, there are very simple arguments to explain why gamma equals 2 is a threshold. So I'll see. Maybe I'll, I'll do that. Um, okay, but that's why. So let me, let me state. So, yeah. So let me state some, some things that are, that are known. So I, I didn't put a name on this theorem, but okay. I, I, maybe, maybe it's, maybe, uh, Julien Barral, who is here, knows who did this first. But uh, there's, there's another. So if I take an open set, okay. so O is an open set in the complex plane. I have, so, <coughs> so uh, yes, expectation. I'm a probabilist, of course, for physicists. This is average with respect to the Gaussian free field. But uh, so expectation will be with respect to the Gaussian free field X. So this volume form, if I integrate some open set, which is non-empty, well, it has a moment of order P, if and only if P 
is smaller than 4 over gamma squared. Okay. So I, I, I'm giving this property. And in fact, uh, if we want to define correlations, we have to we have to give a more precise statement. So now if I take some real number, so let me enumerate a few properties of these measures. And I take a complex guy. Well, I can ask the same question putting a singularity around Z. And the statement is the following. If I look at, if I put some singularity around Z and I integrate it against my volume form and I ask the same question, when is the moment finite? Okay, well, so do I have room? So can I put it here? It's equivalent, this being finite, to the following condition, P smaller than 4 over gamma square infimum. 2 over gamma Q minus alpha, <coughs> where uh, Q is the Q which appears up there. So it's gamma over 2 plus 2 over gamma. So, okay, so this was, so this part, I'm going to take a break of, yeah, two minutes now. So uh, what did I do in this first hour? So I introduced the Gaussian free field I'll be working in in all these lectures. It's written here, so it has this covariance. I introduced the exponential of the Gaussian free field, so this random volume form, and I explained to you, so we admitted that you know, some very important basic properties of these random volume forms, namely that they're non-trivial if and only if I, gamma is in zero two, and when I integrate these volume forms against balls, say open balls, the moments exist if and only if of order p I have this condition and if I put a singularity around a point, so I'm, I'm, I'm adding mass to my random, I'm integrating something which is blowing up around z, then also the moment exists if and only if I have this condition. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm going to stop two minutes now. Okay, so we we, s we start again. Um, okay, so just let me remind, we, we looked at this random variable, so which is, we looked at the average of, of our volume form, our GMC volume form integrated against this singularity which is blowing up. Okay, it's blowing up if, if alpha is positive. And uh, we had a condition, so for existence of this moment, and uh, recall that Q is this. So this is a side remark that for alpha equals gamma over 2, this guy is equal to this guy, okay? So, right? So if alpha is bigger than gamma over 2, putting this, you know, this blowing up singularity is going to make the random variable here with a, you know, uh, a fatter tail, and for alpha smaller than gamma over 2, it doesn't change the moments. Now, I'm not... Is there an explicit formula for this expectation where you just... This one? Yeah. No. No, no, no. Now, what, what's going... The t this guy is lecture 2. In lecture 2, I'm going to compute the tail of this random variable, and I'm going to get a constant over a power and the constant is the two-point correlation function of Liouville. It's uh, the reflection coefficient. And so there's an explicit formula for the tail of this guy, and that's the two-point correlation function of Liouville. So the take-home message, by the way, is that the two-point correlation function of Liouville, you know, the, these, alpha, these quantum sphere objects in uh, the mating of trees paper, they're the constants in the tail expansions of GMC, uh, volume forms. So this is lecture two. Okay, so, but right now I'm going to register this thing here. So now that I've defined, I can, I can give a definition. So here's the definition. I'm, I'm reading 
formula definition. So I'm reading formula 2.13 in the lecture notes. So I didn't put a, it as a definition, uh, I, I, I didn't put it in some kind of box definition, but I'm reading 2.13, and so here's the definition. Product of my fields by definition is equal to 2 mu minus s, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the definition of s, gamma minus 1, gamma s, product 1 over zi minus, so I, I take n points in the complex plane and I'm, I compute an endpoint correlation function, alpha i, alpha j, expectation of something, so I don't have room, I'm going to write this guy, which is the essential part on on, on, on a separate board. So I'm going to write it on here in place of this. So, <laughs> excuse me? I managed to translate physically what it means, this gamma lesson two. It's just saying that this operator e to the gamma x is relevant. And we know that if it's not relevant, then it, there's no continuum leader. Ah. It doesn't make sense to perturb a theory by an operator which is irrelevant. Ah, okay. Yes, but it's it's that it's that if you if if okay it, it, so you're happy now with this thing okay it's just okay if 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 you put you can't put this here with alpha bigger than uh, okay you know with alpha bigger than two. It, it just it, do, it doesn't change the action. Okay. But we actually prove this. <laughs> we spend lots of time. So the expectation here is the main part of Uville. So I'm sorry, I can't write in. So the expectation is. So let me write it like this. Say one over the integral on the complex plane. <coughs> Fx of z, so uh, I did a, a fat or a bold, I don't know, z here. So I integrate my volume form, I take a fractional power of it, and what is s? So s is sum by definition minus 2q over gamma, and what am I integrating? I put a fat z here, product okay so that's the definition. So the Liouville correlation functions are two times mu, so mu is a positive constant. It plays no role, it's just a scaling factor. To the power minus s, s I wrote up there, times gamma minus one, global constant. The gamma function, so I guess everyone knows what the gamma function is, it's uh, you know, it's uh, the complex, uh, the meromorphic function with poles at the, the minus uh, the integers times this cross product, the Gaussian free field part. And what is really special about Uville and what makes it difficult is to compute this expectation. So this part here, it's times to the power s, the integral of my volume form ag integrated against, you know, these, 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 this function. So what is this function? So this is worth one if I'm inside the unit disk and x outside the unit disk, but especially what is, you know, kind of interesting is that you get uh, 1 to the power x minus zk to the power gamma alpha k. You get singularities around the points zk in your definition, and so you have to integrate them against the measure.
So that's the definition, okay? So uh, I decided to, to, to throw this definition in lecture one. Uh, and so um, I'm going to, to, I wanted everyone to see it. I mean, so the, here it is. If you want to say something on Duville, at least if you're a probabilist, you have to study this guy. That's the, that's the goal. I don't know if it's... Okay, so first thing... Is it hard to show in this integral formula? It's, it's not very hard to show from the path integral. It's, okay, I'll explain this in lecture three. The main ingredient is the Gersano theorem, and for a physicist, it's just the complete the square trick. So I don't know if you know the complete the square trick, but... Uh, okay. Oh, you have uh, people who, who, who use complete. But I can explain uh, anyways. When I'll do lecture three, uh, okay. So this is the starting. So first, let me, let, me, let me write the bounds. When does this thing exist in the sense that it's non-trivial, not equal to zero? Well, I've written all, all we need on the board here, okay? If you, you have to check that this moment here exists and is non-trivial, okay? So... So how can you, when do you define these guys? Well, this expectation I wrote here, it belongs to zero infinity, if and only if, minus s, so if I, I, can, I can write it even explicitly, say 2q minus sum for k equals 1 to n, alpha k over gamma, is what? So first thing, if I, you know, if I take some ball which doesn't intersect the ZKs, I need this measure to, to, I need this volume form to have a moment. So I need this bound here. So remember, I'm taking to a power S, minus S, sorry, the Gaussian, the GMC volume form against a function. So I need this to be smaller than 4 over gamma square. Now I also need, if I look at, this guy here, I have to look at what's happening if I integrate, if I look at this guy around a ball centered around zk here, it has to have a moment of, of minus, I mean, it has to, inter, um, has to have a moment of order minus s, right? So I just copy this thing here, and so I need it around each point, and I get infimum with the minimum for k between 1 and n, 2 over gamma, Q minus alpha K. So this is the condition to ensure existence of the Liouville correlations in a probabilistic setting. Okay, so that's the, that's the bound. I just copied the bounds because my function is just, uh, you know, it has gamma alpha K singularity around each point. I just copied these conditions up there. Okay, so that's, uh, <coughs> that's, 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 that's how far you can get using probability to define real correlations. Of course, if you get out of these bounds, you can define this object. It's, it's going to be zero or infinity, but it's not the right object. So using probability enables you to define Newville for a certain set of bounds, but not outside these bounds. Actually, we're trying to see how far we can go with complex alpha k's, etc. But when you're real, this is uh, uh, this is as far as you can get. Okay. So let me make a remark. So, and it's very important that we have these because we want to work on this with these bounds, and 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 they include the famous you know Cyberg bounds. So the Cyberg bounds, 1990. So it's a review that I cite in my lecture notes. The Cyberg bounds are. Oh, sorry, I forgot an essential bound to, um, I forgot, sorry, I have to add them. Where am I going to add them? Uh, I need also that alpha k is smaller than q. So, I need alpha k smaller than q. Okay, because if alpha k is bigger or equal to q, it's easy to show that, in fact, this, this guy is worth infinity almost surely. Okay, so these are the, if alpha k is bigger than q, this is, this guy is worth infinity. 
So these are the two bounds. And they include, so that's as I wanted to say, they include the Cyborg bounds. Okay? So Cyborg was working at, in this path integral formulation in 1990, and he, he found bounds for the existence. And, uh, but we can go beyond the Cyborg bounds, and it's very important to go beyond the Cyborg bounds. So Cyborg, it was uh, 2q minus sum over alpha k negative, and for all k, alpha k smaller than q. Okay, so this, of course, is included. This is a, a bigger, because of course this is positive. So, so these are the bounds for, for existence. Okay, so. Uh, I took some time to, to, uh, to explain. Uh, so of course, these global constants can seem very mysterious, but they're due to the fact that we want to, to show the three-point correlation is DOZZ, and we have to tune the constant for it to be true. Of course, you know, DOZZ is defined up to a constant, but when we prove a theorem, we, <laughs> we need to, to put <laughs> the exact constants we want. Could you put this as a definition? Exactly. Can you explain where it comes from? Lecture three. Okay. The, 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 you, I mean, I, I wanted uh, everyone to see the definition, and, and it's well, you know, it's a well set definition, right? But where does it come from? Well, essentially, this comes from the Liouville potential, which is the, the V phi up there. Uh, and. Uh, and, 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 and this comes from the Gaussian free field part. I mean, everything is explained in lecture three in a transparent way. I mean, uh, and I'll explain next week why, where it comes from. But for now, I'm, I'm trying to, to give the definition. So uh, what, what one can actually show, so the following thing. So the KPZ relation. So the KPZ relation is if I take a Möbius transform on the Riemann sphere, so this will be actually proven in lecture three, but I'm stating it here. So, okay, one can prove the following. So, if I take the correlations at endpoints. Instead, I take them at, I apply a Möbius. So, sorry in my notes, of course, this, these correlations depend on gamma and mu. Then I get that it behaves like a conformal tensor, so I'm happy. This means I didn't, my definition is, is correct. And I have the, so, okay, so this I'll explain better in lecture three, but you can actually, you know, see that it's, you've constructed a, so this is kind of okay for no, people who know nothing of, of conformal field theory, probably this is kind of the definition that says that you've constructed a conformal field theory. You, you, you take a product of fields, you apply a Möbius, and uh, if what you get is the same thing to your points, if you move them with a Möbius, if what you get is the same thing times a product of the derivative of your Möbius to some powers here called the conformal weights, then you've constructed you know, a real conformal field theory. So this is, will be proved in lecture three. Okay, so what am I doing in, at the end of this lecture today? I'm heading to the theorem we proved. Okay, so I have to state this. Okay, so now I, I can head to the theorem. A bit. Um, I don't want to erase the definition, so I'm. Okay, so when you have a Möbius on on the Riemann sphere, when you take three points, there is a unique Möbius. Okay, you take. 
three points and you take another three points, there is a unique Möbius which sends these three points to the other three points. Okay. So this this thing here, this this conformal conv covariance condition, it restricts. It restricts the three-point function. So now I'm, I'm heading to the theorem. So I have a probabilistic expression. And what I know, so this is a very familiar computation for specialist conformal field theory. It's kind of where all of it started. You know, these three-point correlation functions that Polyakov was computing. Well, you have this formula here. Here I have a constant. So I should make it depend on mu in my lecture notes. I didn't make it depend on mu, but it's implicit. So what is this formula? OK, so I want to compute the three-point correlation function of the theory. Um, now, if I apply a Möbius, I have this thing over there happening, okay, these psi primes. So what happens? If I take this guy and I divide it by this guy, if I apply a Möbius to the points, it's not going to move. I, I, take, I use this formula. If I take a Möbius, I know that this is equal to psi prime zi to the power one half, psi prime z j, z j, sorry, to the power one half, z i minus z j. This is a uh, so this is a take home exercise. If I take a z plus b over c z plus d, and I make look at the difference in the complex plane, I get the derivatives times the difference. So if I take this guy, I divide it by this guy, and I apply an animobus. It's easy to see that by using this computation that it doesn't move. So if it doesn't, so since three points can be mapped to three other points, any three other points, this means that the ratio, this three-point correlation function divided by these, this product, it's a constant. So you get for free from this relation that there is some constant, okay, and uh, such that the three-point correlation function is this. So this is a very, you know, it says that the conformal covariance property of correlations in conformal field theory completely restrict the three-point correlation functions up to a constant. And so you can extract this constant. So sometimes you, you so this is what physicists uh, write sometimes, you know, quite naturally, like this. They write it as... Sometimes they write, so you can, you can write this quite naturally too. In physics, you'll, you'll, you'll usually see this like this. Okay, why? Because if you look at this formula, it's easy to see that C gamma alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 is the limit. OK, so let me not get this wrong. Z3 going to infinity. Z3. From, from the formula, OK, if I look at this formula, it's easy to see that if I take this three-point correlation function with the third point going to infinity and I renormalize properly, I get exactly the constant I'm looking for. OK, and I get an explicit expression for this constant in the probabilistic setting. And this constant is worth So remember my S, I'll, I'll, I can recall it. I, so here I'm on, I'm on page 9. I get this expectation, and so I'm introducing a notation. 
So the average with respect to the Gaussian free field of some variable, and what is this variable? Well, it's the same kind of variable you get, except that you have a point at infinity. So it's the integral of x plus So I've sent one of the points to infinity, which I integrate against my GMC, my Gaussian multiplicative chaos volume. So I get this compact formula for the three-point constant. Okay. All right. So now I can state the purpose of these lecture notes, of these Okay, these lectures, which is what we proved. Okay, so S here, let me recall, S is alpha 1, I have three points, minus 2Q over gamma. Now let me make a side remark, just a, a minute side remark for okay, people who know nothing of the bootstrap. Uh, you know, I, I told you in the beginning that our program was kind of to reconcile the bootstrap and probability statistical physics. Now, what do people do in the bootstrap? They start by saying that the three-point correlation function is this. They find a formula for this. So this sets the three-point correlation function. And then recursively, hence the name bootstrap, they, they compute a the four-point, the five-point, the six-point correlation by a recursive procedure. So their, their way of constructing correlations is completely different than what I presented for the past hour. What I did is I, I straight away gave you endpoint correlation functions. I didn't yet explain exactly why they're interesting, but I'll do that in lecture three via the KPZ relation. But I, I gave you a definition for endpoint correlation functions. It's still written here. Now, what they do is they give a definition for the three-point, and then they recursively compute the four-point, the five-point. And what we want to do at the ultimately is to show that what they do in physics when they do that for Liouville is, uh, is, is equal to this probabilistic construction. That's our goal. And the first thing, the first you know, matching part is to show that the constant that they inject in the recursive procedure, the DOZZ formula, it coincides with our probabilistic formula. So this brings the... So what these lectures, I guess, are about. Just, just one question. You, you, in your formula for the last one, the integral, mm -hmm. x plus, right? Yeah, so this is... Plus comes from your proper def the definition of the... Uh, Let me write it. Max of x and 1. Okay. Does it come from the particular GFF you took with the yes. co covariant? Yes. It, 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 it doesn't matter. At, oh, sorry. So that means if you had chosen another normalization, you'd have gotten a slightly different one? Yes. This, uh, this is the background metric. More generally, you take any metric and you get the same formula up to a constant. It's the veil anomaly. But I don't want to talk of veil anomaly in this lecture. I don't want to talk of different metrics I, because I don't want to get you know, people confused. With it. So I just work with one GFF. But I can work with any GFF. And I just have different things here. So there are an infinite number if you want the probabilistic formulas for this. But I chose one for these lectures. OK, so here's. Also, from a practical point of view, yes? it would be interesting to know if uh, the following simple result follows from your theorem, from the deep theorem. That if you just discretize everything naively on the lattice and we compute this thing on the lattice by doing some Monte Carlo simulations and you compute this three point function. Yeah. And then the limit of the lattice space is going to zero, are you going to get this formula? Uh, this one? Yeah. Or the DOZZ? Uh. Well, this one or DOZZ? Yeah, if you discretize the free field. Well, you don't discretize the free field, but you discretize the whole thing. That path integral. Ah, yes. If you discretize that path integral, I mean, you, you, you're going to converge to, yeah, to this thing and to the DOZZ. It's contained. Yeah. I, I think, I, I'm not sure I understand completely, but I think yes. Okay. Maybe. Okay, so here's the, the theorem. So, so 
with my co-authors, so Antti, Kupienen, and Remy Rod. So it's based on two papers. <coughs> so C gamma, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3. This thing I define is fractional moment, so it's a moment of some variable depending on alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 inside the variable, but also in the moment. So because S is related to the alpha i's. This thing here is equal, so assuming, of course, that alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 are real, which satisfy the, the bounds I, I gave you, so, so alpha 1, alpha 2 satisfy So the, it's written in the notes, but you know, you, for n equals three, um, there's a gamma here, uh, two over gamma. So if if they you know if they, I wrote it, uh, okay, previously, but if they satisfy these bounds. Oh, I can, I can write it a bit more nice. Ah, <laughs> I'm getting tired, so it's 2Q. So the condition for it to exist on the probability side, okay. So if I have these bounds, then the theorem says, put it here so that this constant that this fractional moment equals the OZZ formula okay so uh, of course <coughs> I didn't define the DOZZ formula so I have no I have time let me, let me write the DOZZ formula. It's written, so at the beginning, really at the beginning of the notes, I wrote this, okay, kind of, it's a, it's a really non-trivial formula. So, so in order to, to, to gain a little bit of time, I encourage you in the lecture notes to look at expression 1.6. So 1.6, rather than me writing it wrong, 1.6 is a clean definition of Zamolotikov's epsilon function, which is a, holo a holomorphic function defined on the complex plane, depending on the parameter gamma over 2, and which has simple zeros that I've, I've indicated. So the DOZZ formula is this. So this constant I defined, this three point, is equal to the following formula. So P, pi, sorry, mu, L, gamma square over four, gamma over two, two minus gamma square over two, times two Q minus alpha one minus alpha two minus alpha three over gamma times, so star, and what is star? Okay, so let me first say what L is. So first L, sorry, so what is L? I'm introducing two special functions, the epsilon function from Zamolochikov and the L function. So the L function is just the standard gamma function taken at point x, divided by the gamma function taken at point 1 minus x. So in physics, usually, OK, I'm going to write it in a different color. So let me start by, by um, red. OK, red. So in f physics, L of x is usually denoted gamma of x. But I obviously don't want to take this notation. 
And in physics, usually people work with the potential exponential minus 2 to b phi. And so b is equal to gamma over 2. This is you know, math to physics translation. Okay, just and phys physicists call gamma over 2b, and they call this L function the gamma function. Okay. At least, okay, I, I work a lot with Sylvain Ribot's review, and maybe it's standard notation, I think. And what is so the DOZZ formula? It's so this gamma function, well, double uh, two gamma functions to this power here times something, and this something is what? It's Zamorochikov's, so it's. So Zamorashikov's special function that you take So I'm going to explain what alpha bar is in a minute. So of course by symmetry, you know, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 play the same role. So you see this, of course, on the formula. Okay, so there's four epsilon functions. So I encourage you to look at this function. It's the relation 1.6, page 3. Okay, and alpha bar is, I should have put it here, actually. It's the sum of the alpha i's. So I'll put alpha bar, and I'll put here that... So DOZZ is this thing to the power 2Q minus alpha bar over gamma times, you know, eight epsilon Zamoluchikov functions. And alpha bar is the sum of the alpha i's. So this is what we proved. Okay. That's the, the, the statement. So you see, when we started a few years ago, uh, we had these path integral descriptions up there. And, uh, well, it, you know, there were discussions in physics on how much it, these path integrals are related to these formulas. Uh, and, um, and uh, okay, we tried to understand it, and, you know, after some work, we, we managed to prove this theorem. Okay, so we have our first uh, link with the conformal bootstrap approach of, of Uville. So the second open problem would be to show that, you know, four point, five point correlation functions are given by these bootstrap procedures. So this is still an open problem. Okay. So I have a, uh, okay, I have 20 minutes left. So I'm going to explain to you now how DOZZ found DOZZ. Okay. So I'm going to, the good, the good news is that I can cast the derivation within my, probabilistic framework. Of course, they were using path integrals and everything, but we can translate in the probabilistic language what they did. So that's what, that's what I'm going to do in, uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes. So let me, let me just, okay, let me just say a word on this DOZZ formula, which is going, so I'm going to set it up there for good. So of course, uh, let me let me start by by you know uh, where's the eraser? Oh, is it on? So d let me insist the notations are fixed. Huh? So when you see the uh, this L function, it's gamma of uh, gamma of x divided by gamma one minus x. So of course, I mean, the first time you see this formula, it's, 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 it's very mysterious, uh, I, I guess, for most of you. The second time you see it, it's still very mysterious. But <laughs> if you look at it a bit, at the end, you, you, you start to understand what happens. So let me say that a crucial point on this formula is, is the following. If I take this function, okay, so DOZZ. So 
let me write something that you can show. So this epsilon function here, it has very special properties. You know, when you shift it by some by gamma over two. So I wrote the relations in, in the lecture notes. And it's this this function is it's a function when you shift it by gamma over two or, or two over gamma, then you 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 get you you get a you, it's it's relation one point seven. You get that it's the ratio of two gamma functions times the initial function. So it has very it has two very special uh, this epsilon function has two very special uh, properties with respect to shift. And if you look at these, well, what happens when you look at the DOZZ formula where you change one of the alpha one, say alpha i, so alpha one by plus gamma, you get this formula here. You get that this is equal, so I'm not, I'm skipping the computation, but you get that it's this L function, so it's going to appear everywhere in this talk. Gamma alpha one over two, L of gamma alpha one over two plus gamma square over four, L of gamma over four, alpha bar minus two alpha one minus gamma divided, so alpha bar is alpha one plus alpha two plus alpha three. So you get some crazy formula too, which is the way when you apply a shift, so what I call a shift is you shift by gamma, say one of the, the, the alphas, you get this relation. And okay, but it's written, it's 2.22, relation 2.22. So I hope this is readable. Yeah, minus 2 alpha 3. Okay, and remember that L of x. So this comes out of very special properties of the epsilon function here. So you have this special property, and actually you have the same dual property. But you get the same equation by replacing gamma over 2 everywhere by 2 over gamma. But, and this is kind of, you know, you replace mu by a dual, so this is by a dual cosmological constant, mu. So I don't know it by heart, and this dual, yes, it's equal to minus. To the power of 4. Okay, so it's a bit, you know, complicated business, these formulas, but okay. So if you change one of the alphas by alpha plus gamma, you get... The ratio is worth, you know, these, the, the, all these products of L functions. And you get the same thing if you, if you shift by plus 4 over gamma, because you're replacing. And you replace your mu by some other mu, mu tilde, called the dual cosmological. I mean, this is just uh, stuff that comes out of complex analysis with this formula. It's because of the very special problem. So let's just register this crazy formula. And now I'm going to explain how... Uh, DOZZ found the DOZZ formula. Okay? Good. I have. So let's go. What did they do? Okay, so I am following page 10, the derivation of the DOZZ formula in physics, analytic continuation of the dotsenko fateyev integrals. What did they do? They guessed, and uh, they're kind of you know geniuses to guess exact formulas. I I I have to admit that it's kind of amazing how they guessed this formula. So I I want to try to explain to you, communicate to you how you do. So there is one case up there where it seems easy to compute this thing. What is it? Is if minus s is an integer. Because it's much easier to compute integer moments than fractional moments. It's, it's this 
It's always the same game in statistical physics. You can compute integral moments, but you can't compute fractional ones. And what a physicist does, he computes integral moments, and then he tries to guess what it's worth if you change the integral with any parameter. And it usually always works, but uh, then we spend years proving that. And that's exactly what DOZZ did. So they looked at the limit when S, so S, remember, is uh, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 minus 2q over gamma. So you look at this, and you take the limit where this guy goes to minus n, an integer, so n an integer. Why am I taking, so I take a, a limit because you see for minus an integer, this is blowing up, this is the gamma function. It has a pole at minus an integer, and the pole is, uh, uh, the pole is minus 1 power n divided by factorial n. Okay, so the limit s goes to minus n, s plus n, so this is easy, this is standard business, you know. This is minus 1 to the power n over factorial n for the standard gamma function. It's, it has a pole, and it's, the residue is this, for the gamma function. So if you take the limit of this guy, okay, what happens? Well, it's equal to, let me follow my notes, it's equal to 2 minus mu to the power n over factorial n, so there's a gamma minus 1, actually, but I'll, I'll divide by that. It's a global constant. Never mind, OK? Uh, expectation of my business to the power n. Alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 divided by x to the power gamma alpha 1, 1 minus x, gamma alpha 2. Okay, exponential, so I'm writing my measure an, an under the, the formal notation to the power n. Now I can compute this, right? How do I compute this? So a probabilist or I mean a mathematician says, I use Fubini. So I, this is this to the power n, it's like an n-fold integral with respect to n variables, and then I can interchange the average with respect to the randomness and the average on the complex plane. If I do that, okay, I'm going to get, okay, I'm going to get this, so 2 minus mu to the power n, factorial n of so I'm doing it at a formal level, but everything can be made completely rigorous. You just regularize your field here, and then you go to the limit. And what do you get? You get the integral over n point, so n in the complex plane, product gamma alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 divided by xj gamma alpha 1, 1 minus xj, gamma alpha 2. Okay, expectation, product of these parts. So this, people who do statistical physics are, you know, they recognize straight away what, what's going on here. Oh, I always forget to square here. Okay, it's a square. Okay. So I get this product, and I get a product of the, of the measures, right? OK, so I can even write this explicitly. Remember that, that this g function, it's nothing but uh, no, there's no expectation anymore. OK, I, I, I did Fubini. Now this is a Gaussian variable, so I can compute everything, right? Okay, it's it's so this is just the product for i smaller than j, okay, of one over x i minus x j to the power gamma square. <coughs> uh, and I still have to do 
Uh, so I still have these guys too. Let me do it a bit more. So this is not true. Uh, let me let me do it by steps because otherwise I, it's the end. So I'm going to mess up what I'm going. So this is. Let me write this more. This is going to be expectation gamma square sum i smaller than j. I have a Gaussian here, so. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. So this, this is worth this. Okay. Because. Uh, okay. Of course, I regularize this. This thing. I take the the variance of the sum here, and these guys to cancel out, and I just have the cross terms. I'm doing a very simple Gaussian computation here. Now, if I, and remember that this guy, here. Remember the formula is x of x, x of y. The covariance is nothing but log 1 over x minus y plus log of x plus plus log of x y plus. So this is max of y and 1, remember? Now if you, so if I use this formula here that I have here, I inject it here, you know, I massage a bit all this. What do I get at the end? I get this. 2 minus mu to the power n over factorial n integral cn product j equals 1 to n. So xj plus gamma alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3 plus gamma square r n minus 1 minus 4 product 1 over xi minus xj to the power gamma square. So xj gamma alpha 1, 1 minus xj gamma alpha 2. OK, and I forgot here the product. Of OK. So it's kind of OK. It's, it's a bit nasty computation, but so you get this thing. Okay, I'm integrating on x1, xn. I have this formula. And if you look at things, so what is important in this formula is that if this is equal to minus n here, you can see that this is equivalent to, sorry, this is equal to 0. So this is equal to 1. So this guy is 1. So this is exactly what Bertrand was referring to, it's independent of the background metric. This is the veil anomaly. In my computation, this thing has to disappear because it's completely arbitrary. So I get 1 here. And then I get this, this integral, 1 over this, these products. And then it's the dotsenko fateyev integrals, you know, the ones they computed to construct the, the three-point structure constants. And so you have a formula. And I'm going to conclude in a few minutes. Yeah, in one or two minutes. And if you go see in the, so DOZZ went to look at the, <coughs> they went into the, to look into the dotsenko fateyev papers and they found an exact formula for this guy. And they found a crazy formula. Okay, so. OK, and I'm going to stop here because they found lots of L functions and everything. So the, all these, these formula, these, these integral moments were computed by Dotsenko Fateyev. They found, you know, so it's written on page 10. They found a, a, a crazy formula, uh, Dotsenko Fateyev, for these integrals. And then what did DOZZ do? Well, they, they replaced N here by these, this, this sum, by sum of the alphas minus 2q over gamma in an analytic way. But um, so let me finish with this. So at the end, at the end, if I call this integral,
fine. So if I call this, like in my notes, IN of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, they found that if I look at IN minus 1 of alpha 1 plus gamma, alpha 2, alpha 3, and they divide by IN. So this means that essentially, you know, if you add gamma to alpha 1, then of course if you add gamma to alpha 1, you're pushing N to N minus 1. And so they did the ratio of the Dutz and Kofateyev integrals, and they found that this ratio here, well, if you do the substitution of alpha 1 plus alpha 2 plus alpha 3, minus 2q equals minus gamma n. So you replace the n's everywhere by this thing here. They found exactly this. But I'm not going to write it. So they found this thing here. So I went a bit quick, but essentially they computed for very special integral values of the alpha i's, the, the, the moment of these volume, GMC volume forms. They found an expression with lots of L functions. They couldn't, you couldn't really do much on this. So they, you do the ratio when you shift one of the alpha, the alpha one, say, by gamma. And when you shift it, the ratio of, of all these L functions all over the place, well, you can see that if you, then you can replace n by its value here and you end up with this formula. So they said, okay, what is true when sum of the alpha i's minus 2q goes minus gamma n? Well, we can, we can imagine it's going to be true for any value of the alpha i's. And so they guessed this uh, formula like that. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop uh, here. Thank you.